So welcome back to the wonderful world of online and face-to-face learning because I'm doing my podcast in my face-to-face section. I've found that these are a bit more engaging because I actually have student participation in the podcast, which is nice. Um, And we're actually going to start with that today because, okay, how many people in here have jobs? Raise your hand. Okay, out of my giant class full of students today, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine people have jobs. Okay. And there's only... 13 people here today. So that's a high percentage. So most people are working their way through school. Most have jobs and the ones that don't, that's awesome for them because they have more time to do their schoolwork. Uh, They might be making money on the side doing something else. Um, I thought you were in sales, but you didn't raise your hand when I said, I got one. Yeah. It's on and off. Yeah. Okay. See, so, okay. With all the jobs you've had, forget if you're working right now or not. How many weeks do you think where, where at your work, you would have had to complete more than two to three pages of paperwork where there's fields to fill in almost every line. Raise your hand. Two people. Okay, what do you guys do? I do orders for pep stores. Oh, that's right, orders, yeah. Okay, super annoying. So you're you're in logistics Basically. and you're not gonna be able to avoid paperwork to save your life. So uh, is, what do you do? I worked at Remax. I deal with all this paperwork. Oh, so the only other person that raised their hand actually has had to deal with real estate paperwork uh, for a job. And the reason that happens is because realtors get so busy that they can no longer handle, as simple as it may be, the time that it consumes to do all this paperwork. It's just nuts. So this is a profession where you will not be able to get away from paperwork like someone who has to deal with logistics, who has to place orders all the time. But even in that sense, it's probably very routine and very much the same over and over and over again, where every time you do an agreement in real estate, it's different. It's very hard to use templates. I will show you today how I try to do that in some ways. I use a really cool platform called DocuSign. Uh, They're not paying me anything to talk about them in this podcast. I can assure you that, but uh, ever since I got DocuSign, it has changed my life. But the paperwork is still overwhelming uh, if you're a busy realtor, it, it just is. So, and you can see most people have jobs where that just isn't an issue. Even as you get into long-term careers after graduating from school, you might do a lot of paperwork when you start work somewhere, but it's just not a common thing. So professions where you are in sales, there will always be contracts. There will always be agreements. And this is the biggest part of your business in terms of making sure you get paid is making sure you don't mess up your agreement. So you knew this week was coming, despite the fact that this is not a course where I'm trying to teach you every aspect of being a realtor in Ontario. I'm trying to teach you a lot about being in the sales profession career and give you a preview of what it might be like. We have to spend a week on paperwork because there's a lot going on there. So today, that's what we're gonna talk about. Okay, and as I mentioned, DocuSign has made this a lot easier. The the world of paperwork has changed a lot for me since I became a licensed salesperson when I started. Uh, The Real Estate Council of Ontario, I don't believe they were okay with digital signatures or they hadn't really specified anything around that subject. Uh, Lawyers, for example, most lawyers, and I think this might still be Ontario legislation, that you can't do anything unless it's in person and it's hard copy. No, insurance you can. Insurance you can, okay, so insurance you can. Yeah, I did. I just did insurance too, totally digital. Um, every time I've bought or sold a property, I've had to go to the lawyer's office. I've tried in every which way to not have to do that because I'm out of town a lot, I'm moving around a lot, I'm doing a lot of stuff, and it just hasn't been the easiest thing to get a lawyer to do. You have to meet another lawyer in the other town, and this is just really tricky. So one big thing I want to mention at the beginning here is that we are okay with that now in the real estate industry, and digital signature software has basically saved us tons of time, but even having that with you on your side, it's still, um, as I said, overwhelming. So we're gonna talk about real estate paperwork. We're gonna talk about the regulatory bodies that are looking at your paperwork all the time, because it's not just your brokerage office. And we're gonna get into the LAD registry system. And I'll mention DocuSign too. I, don't, I didn't wanna put it right in the header because I didn't wanna make it like a pitch for DocuSign. There's about three or four really good digital signature programs. I just think DocuSign's the easiest for my clients to figure out when they've never used it before. Okay, that's why I bring that up. And then we're gonna talk about the many varied real estate career paths, which we have already talked about and discussed in previous podcasts, but because 
Uh, this is one of those lectures where you're going to realize how much you're going to learn as soon as you start into the business and start doing paperwork. You're going to you're going to be exposed to all these different things and all these aspects of your clients, buyers, sellers, whatever it may be, and you're going to learn so much about them and about yourself at the same time. And it's that first year in real estate with crap loads of paperwork that often sends people into these other industries and that doesn't mean any of the education they have was all for naught you understand what i'm saying so that you could go through the course load and go through the program at humber and end up not pursuing a career in licensed real estate sales full-time but end up using that knowledge for something else and i thought this was a good week to kind of remind you of that because we haven't brought it up since the beginning of the course there's lots of other paths you can take some of them have more paperwork some of them don't so i'll talk about that at the end as well so uh what i'm about to do in, in this situation i'm going to walk you through a bunch of the aspects and components of paperwork and i'm going to use a residential listing to start and then an offer to purchase a residential property to wrap it up so we're going to have uh, a listing and a sale a buyer Okay, so a seller and a buyer. And I'm gonna show you the paperwork for both. I'm not gonna mix it in with the commercial. Commercial would be pretty similar to what you're gonna see here. Certain forms that you're gonna see as part of these packages that I've put for you on Fanshawe Online that I've placed in there for you would be the same, whether it's commercial or residential. But we're gonna start with this form. So as I'm going through here, you will see certain things that we're gonna discuss and anything in the form, like a, like a, a large, like probably, even though we will have spent seven weeks covering material since this test, I'd say there'd still be a good 15, maybe even 20% of the test that might relate to questions about paperwork. Obvious questions where if you've at least spent an hour just looking at these agreements and gone through them and you understand what they're all about, you'd be able to answer these questions. So I will have some questions on the test that pertain specifically to paperwork. Um, Typically ones that I will have covered in the lecture. So we're going to talk, this is where you set your commission out. This is where you set out how long you're going to list a property for. Like all this stuff has to be specific. You don't just talk to a buddy and say, yeah, I'm going to throw your property up. Go put a sign up and take some pictures and stick it on there. And most brokerage offices are so busy that you could do that. And they probably would not be tracking you down for your paperwork if you've taken the broker load course, which most salespeople have. Most salespeople, if they've been in business for more than a few months and they're comfortable and they're starting to get listings, they automatically just take the course so that they know how to load their own listings. They're already having to fill out all the paperwork. All you're doing is taking all the information from that and sticking it in all the fields online. So you're gonna see me doing stuff like this today so you can see how it would be if you had to do this. And I've complained for several years about the fact that these data input forms for listings, which have all the different fields that you need for the room sizes and all this stuff, that if you fill those out digitally and sit down with your owner and get it all filled out, there's no way to directly transfer all that information right into a listing on your board because every board is different. So you still have to go and type, basically you're copying and pasting the stuff back out. So what I usually do is I usually build the listing first and then I put that stuff into the contract and then make them sign it. It's, you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. So you do need all these details on the property. I was kind of a tiny bit ahead of myself there. So commission set, term of the contract, details on the property. Meaning what? Who owns it? Oh, well, it's my, my mother-in-law and she's passed away. Okay, well, why are you signing the papers? Well, I've been given power of attorney by the lawyer. Okay, well, I need to see that. I need a copy of that for my office. You, you need everything. Okay, you basically need a file that would enable you to steal this person's identity. And if you were ever to do that as a licensed salesperson, you would not only lose your license, you would end up in jail. So I'm just explaining to you how much information you need. And by referring to the, the amount of information as enough to steal someone's identity, that should indicate to you how difficult it is sometimes when you're dealing with often older clients. Well, I need to pick a, take a picture of your driver's license, the front. Just the front, not even the back. No, no, you can't do that. You, you don't need a picture. What do you need that for? Then you got my address. I'm like, I'm at your house. I already have your address. I need a picture. And sometimes clients are difficult. So that's when it's really good to understand why you need that information. So we're going to talk about that today too. It's a federal government program to monitor uh, money from the proceeds of crime and where they're going. And it doesn't matter if these people are criminals or not. You still have to do it. So. 
As long as you place the blame on the government, usually you're fine and you get the information you need. And you do need to keep that information very private. It stays private on your computer, it, like in files, and it stays private with the brokerage. You don't like publish this and send it around and say, hey, I know how old this person is. Check out her ID. And it's some friend that says she was 36, but she's really not. And you know, you can't do that stuff, okay? This is all private. So you do need all the information on an owner, including power of attorney, because if, they, if they're not on title, but they can legally sign for the person on title because they passed away, you need that information. Um, usually when someone passes away and there's other people that were on title with them, on title what I mean is ownership. Like when you have ownership for a car, who's on the piece of paper? Okay, so if you have deceased owners, which is the next thing I was gonna talk about here, and this just happened with my grandmother. You guys know this semester my grandfather passed away and that was very sad, and I've been helping her with her house. So she's still on the piece of paper, the ownership for her house. We call them titles or deeds, okay? The same as a vehicle with my grandfather. So he's Ulrich and she's on there as Anna, and, but he's passed away. So when you list a property like that, you don't put both names, even though you're almost always supposed to put everything you find in registry under ownership, you're supposed to put that in the listing unless those people have passed away or the company's dissolved and it's in receivership and it's a bank sale and it's some other thing going on. So typically you'll be informed or you'll be well aware if somebody that is listed as an owner isn't alive anymore because you don't want to list that person anymore because then they'll have to sign for everything and if they've passed away that's going to be pretty hard. Okay, so there's exceptions to it but generally speaking you need to go into registry access the file for that property and whoever's on title, that's the owner. Oh no, well Bob said I could sign for him because he's away for a couple weeks. Well, I need to see power of attorney then or I need to meet Bob and he needs to give you permission to do that. I need documentation on this. You can't just put what you want. So it's very important you get the right details. And then of course all the house stuff. How old is it? What's the age? Because we have something, and this isn't listed in my notes, but it will be, I'm gonna have this, I'm gonna add this to one of the slides. We have uh, errors and omissions coverage. We're basically covered by the errors and omissions clause that, you know what, sometimes the best we can do is provide the information that the owners give us. Now, I'm telling you right now, as your professor who's teaching you how to be a good salesperson if you were to get into this business, and it should be the same in any sales profession, it's not good enough, okay? If, there, if you have a means to find out when the house was built, spend the $8, pay for the record, and find out you do. Don't just take the owner's word for it and don't ever go back to the previous listing and assume it's going to be correct because it may not be. If you know the realtor really well and you know they're super anal about measurements, maybe they put the right measurements in. But when was the renovation? How big are the rooms? How many rooms are there? What are the sizes of the rooms? What are the location features? Is it close to parks? Is it not close to parks? These are actually input fields in the listing. Like where? what are the schools around it? You can type in the schools. Why would you leave that blank? If families are looking at that listing, why wouldn't you want them to know how close it is to some of these schools? It drives me nuts when realtors leave stuff blank that might provide more information that could be useful to certain types of buyers. You don't know the exact details of your buyers. You know the general demographic, but you're never going to be sure who it is and how many kids they're going to have and what's going on. Special features in the house, servicing, zoning. I love it when, when realtor salespeople, they just put res, R-E-S, res, it's residential. It's not good enough, okay? A city or a municipality typically will have anywhere from eight to 25 different types of residential zoning. So which one is it? Because I wanna put a duplex here and I wanna know if it's legal. See how, ma see how much the details matter? So my big pitch on the listing here, and I, I don't have enough time even in five or six classes to show you how well you can go and find all this stuff. I'm gonna show you previews and little bits and pieces of it. Um, and once you get all that stuff done, if for some reason the market's gone a little cold, you haven't sold the property, it's kind of nice to be able to just reboot that by extending the expiry. But a lot of sellers, they want you to let it expire and then relist it a little bit later so it looks like a new listing. And I just wanted to remind all my students that will make a little bit more work because you'll have to re-input all those things. Now, the new system we got last year, you can actually clone if it's your listing, only if it's your listing, you can't clone somebody else's. Um, you can actually clone the listing you put into the board backend 
and make another listing with almost all the same details so it doesn't take much time. You still have to re-upload all the photos and if you do photo text, you have to put that all back in so you gotta cut and paste and move. But you'll never lose your old listing. So where I used to be kind of annoyed about rebooting, which is like letting it expire and then completely redoing the listing, now it's a lot easier. And I imagine things will only keep getting easier if you guys decide to become realtors. So there is something to be said for letting it expire, giving it a few weeks or a month and then putting it back up. You know, you could say the owner, well, the owner wanted to fix a couple things and then relist and now it's better for the same price. Or, you know, we had to do some thinking to do and now they've come back at a better price for you guys and stuff like that. Um, so we're gonna jump into the paperwork here in a second. Um, and I just want you to know where most of this stuff is coming from because we're not gonna go there yet until a little bit later. So the registry system, which went live and digital electronically somewhere in the 80s, I think. It's hard, it's, it, you do see records that go back further than that, but most of the stuff we need to know about is pretty recent. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Like, wow, they just bought this a year ago, what'd they pay then? And you can look it up in registry. You can also look it up in your board's listings, previous listings. But you gotta watch out because some of those previous listings, they might not have the right price in there. There might have been a price that was renegotiated afterwards because something happened to the house or they, they came across some issue they weren't aware of or maybe they, they were getting ready for closing and the buyer couldn't close on it in time so the buyer ended up having to pay more, which is kind of interesting when that happens too, um, to extend the closing. So I always, I do check the history wherever in the real estate board where I've been working, but I always check registry to see if it matches up, right? And registry is the one that's typically correct. Um, municipal city zoning mapping and information, you don't need a subscription to access that stuff. You, you need Google, that's it. And you'll be able to find it. But realtors usually never bother to do that. And they just put down res, com, C-O-M-M -M for commercial. And that's really dicey because the commercial zoning classifications in different municipalities and cities, they can be drastically different in terms of what you're allowed to do there. Um, so this is a huge deal and part of doing your research when you're, when you're putting a listing together. Um, you can list on the MLS, so on realtor.ca with a client. You can also enter into a contract where you just have a sign on the property and it's called exclusive where you don't put it on realtor.ca. Now, uh, per my lecture uh, back in when was that week nine, when we talked about the major platforms and how and the power of Realtor.ca and how it's still unlike in the states where they they have some alternatives to the MLS in the states, Realtor.ca just dominates in Canada by far, huge. Um, you're really not doing yourselves favors by not putting it up there, but they do have a listing option to just do it exclusive. And then you have these situations where there's a guy in town that's gone to half the realtors in town and said, hey, get me this much for my property and I'll give you this much commission. That's not really much of an agreement at all. It's kind of up in the air. You need to be careful sending people to those types of sellers because you might end up getting them connected and then being completely cut out. And if you have nothing on paper, you have nothing to make sure you make any money. Listen, I'm, I'm not trying to say I don't give people good deals. And there's a lot of people I trust way past the point where I even need the paperwork right up front. But it's, especially when you're starting out, you just need to be really careful. You just, and there are tactful ways to do it without making your clients feel like you you don't trust them. Oh, you don't trust me? So you have to have all this in writing? No, I trust you just fine. My brokerage basically won't let me work there if I don't have all this in writing, which you guys know is untrue because every brokerage will take anybody that'll sell at least one house a year because they're gonna make money off it, right? It, they'll take anybody that doesn't sell anything because they'll still be paying fees at most brokerages. But you could totally blame it on the brokerage, throw the brokerage under the bus. But they offer a lot of support, you know, so, and I have some colleagues that I work there with that I've been with for a long time and I don't want to leave there, but that's their policy. I'm sorry. Now, good luck trying that with commission. Sorry, my office won't let me go below 4% commission. People know that, people know better at this point that you have the flexibility to charge your own commission rates. But you could say that about some of the paperwork to make them feel more comfortable. FinTrack, that's not even your, your office. That's the Canadian government. There's no way around it. Okay, so um, let's take a look at some of this paperwork. We'll talk about HST right after that. Uh, I have open in Acrobat here. 
a sample listing package. So in this listing agreement, you are obligated by the Real Estate Council of Ontario to go through every bit of it with your sellers. Okay, and now that does get to be a little cumbersome because people get so comfortable with the, the nature of digitally signing that. So now at this point, if I've worked with somebody before and I know they've gone through the listing agreement, every time I still send them one, if I'm selling another one of their properties, I say, do you need me to go over anything in the listing agreement? If there's been updates to it or changes since the last time they signed one, I say, oh, you know, they, they updated that one clause about um, uh, the warranty clause and said that they changed some wording in it. That's not actually true. But, um, and there's, there's not as much in here as there is in an agreement of purchase and sale. But there's a lot of stuff in here. And in the context of this podcast, I'm not going to go through it all. I'm going to point some things out. Uh, but I'm just going to show you what this looks like. So these are pre-made forms. You don't make up an agreement. You will make up certain clauses and you will have sellers that need special language in their contracts. And there are places for that. You can add schedules to any of these agreements. A schedule would be like an addendum, right? Or some, or like an index or not, no, not an index. Almost like an appendix to a book where there's additional information at the end. They call them schedules with real estate contracts, okay? So you have a listing agreement and certain things need to go in here. The address goes here. The time at which you can start promoting the property for sale goes here. And the day on which you are no longer asked to do that, according to the seller, the price. This is a new one. This just came out maybe 18 months ago or so. Seller hereby represents and warrants that they are not party to another listing agreement because there were sellers that were going and secretly listing their properties with multiple realtors and not telling one or the other to see if they could get more leverage on the market. Just ridiculous stuff, right? You can't, then, then who gets the commission, right? Oh, whichever realtor sells it. Well, it's, this isn't Brazil, right? We talked about Brazil. They have a market that's more like that. Our market is more regulated. Everything in Canada is very regulated. Everything in Ontario is even more regulated, okay? And I'm not saying that to be negative. For once, unlike speed limits on the 402, which finally just got raised to 110, which is nice because it's like there's nothing there. It seems to make more sense to me um, that it's in line with the speed limits on I-94 where it connects in the States. Uh, for once, I'm actually in favor of this type of profession being more regulated because I don't want people involved that are going to mess all this stuff up, right? I often have to fix a lot of things in paperwork when I get them from other realtors because they've missed things, they haven't filled stuff in, you're selling a condo and they didn't fill in any of the information on the management company. So you basically, when you start out, you just have to go through here and take a look at this stuff and understand it. And when they're teaching you at Humber, they will, you will study these agreements inside and out and know what every clause really means. And then the expectation is that you leave your courses and go and do that with every single client. I'm not going to lie and I'm, I hesitate to even record this, but I, I have not really done that. It's been years since I've sat down with a client and gone through every single clause. I typically will always do, are you comfortable with all of the information in this paperwork? Do you need me to explain everything? It is my job to go through it all with you, but I know you've done that before. See, I have to say that. And then when they say, yeah, I'm good, I'd be like, yep. And there's, there's sellers that I don't even need to say that to anymore, right? It's like when a cop arrests somebody and they know they've been arrested so many times they don't have to read them the rights. I'm kidding. That always has to happen. This is very different, okay? So this is a situation where it's your job to make sure the client understands everything in the agreement. And I'm still doing that. But when I first started, I was a total nerd about this. And I had somebody that basically, they were ready to cancel the whole thing if I didn't just shut up and let them sign the papers. Because it does take a while. So you have to go through and explain what irrevocable means. Sometimes people don't know that, you know, like an irrevocable date on a contract is, is like when anytime after this date, if it's not signed yet, then it's dead. We'd have to redo it with a new date. It's the expiry of the contract as it sits there waiting for the other party to agree to it. It's an expiry date, right? Seller is willing to go MLS or exclusive. So on realtor.ca or not on realtor.ca. Okay. If it's more than six months, you got to initial here. This is a bunch of legal language that I'm not going to see. I won't, I will not test you on stuff that's inside of actual clauses. I will basically ask you like, what agreement 
or what, what form, and I probably won't use the form number, what form would you have to do this on? Is that a listing agreement? Is that a schedule? Is that the input agreement? I, I will ask you pretty basic stuff. Um, but the contract has to be defined. This is where you put the commission. So here you always put the total commission. And then here is where you would identify what you get if there's only one realtor involved. Remember the double-ended scenario? That's what you want. And unlike a lot of the older school realtors, I offer a better situation there. So I'll show you one. Um, I'll show you one unsigned. That way I'm not breaching confidentiality with the client here. Um, so I'm gonna, so this is all there. So now I'm gonna switch over to my platform. And as I'm going through, you're gonna see stuff in here um, already set up because what you're probably wondering now is, okay, cool. So do I print that out and then write it all in? There are lots of realtors that still do that. I would never ever freaking do that. I don't know why you would do that. Um, here's one that I just set up uh, not too long ago. Let me see here. You know what? I'll do I'll do my own house because I don't ever I wouldn't want to ever be seen as breaching confidentiality inside of a podcast video. Just because I'm a teacher doesn't mean I can start showing where everybody lives and all sorts of stuff. So. I will do my own listing documents. This is a house we used to own. We sold it in August. Um, I still have to sign the listing documents as the owner, despite the fact I'm also the listing salesperson. So I'm gonna start and go through the same exact papers that I gave you guys in FOL and just show you a little bit of what's going on here. Okay, and then I'm gonna do the same thing for a purchase and then you will have had your crash course on paperwork, so to speak. So here was my price. That's the price my wife and I agreed we'd be safe at. We were gonna leave it listed till January 31st. It already sold, so that's irrelevant, right? The expiry date of the contract, or the expiry date of the listing, the expiry of the contract was really like um, exclusive and irrevocable commencing at, so within these dates, if someone signed it, then it's, it's a live deal, all right? So even if you put August 20th here and they don't sign it till the 23rd or something like that, that still makes the listing agreement valid. When you have the expiry on a sales agreement where you're trying to buy something, especially if there's multiple offers, like here's my offer, it's good till five o'clock. If they sign it and get it back to you at 7.30, you don't have to accept it. If they sign it and get it back to you at five o'clock and you agreed to buy that house with no conditions at all, like home inspection, finance, nothing like that, then you're buying it, okay? Because if you don't buy it, they can sue you for non-performance and sue you for the difference in what they might get for it later because your sales screwed it up and then you don't ever want to not close on a property once you've removed all the conditions. So, but we're still talking about listings here. So this is my listing. Um, this is a very unique situation I had here where I was 2% and I'm taking nothing because I'm not, I'm not charging myself commission. You know what? I pay enough tax. There's no point in charging myself commission. I did a commission free listing. Um, it works out the same way if I charge myself commission, except I have to pay tax on it. This is why I always wonder why salespeople, I don't know who explained to them the math of that, but if you don't charge yourself commission, you just get whatever price you sell it for, right? I sold mine for $4.95. If I charged myself commission through the brokerage, that would have been 2% that goes through the brokerage. I still wouldn't have been, remember last week how I explained how my commission worked? I still wouldn't have been over my 40% yet, so I would have had to pay the brokerage a cut of that, and I would have had to pay HSC on it, and I would have had to pay income tax on it. Yet almost every realtor I see that lists their own property has a commission in there for themselves. And I hope that it's just to take it out at the end to make things more negotiable, but I don't know why they do it. I don't understand it. So I've never done that with my own house. At Royal LePage, we get two free deals a year. Otherwise you have to pay the office fee, which is like 380 bucks. Like you can't just start running free deals through a real estate brokerage, it doesn't work like that. But I've made them enough money that they don't care. I get two free deals a year. So usually if I'm trying to be competitive, I'll have like 3.5 in there, 3.5% right there. And if I sell it myself, I'll maybe be at 2.75 or even two and a half and sometimes even lower. And then this is where the, but the total commission the brokerage is paying is always in there because technically, it's your brokerage that gets paid and then they pay you because you cannot act in sales in real estate without a brokerage. So it goes through them. Um, but I didn't do that here. I just decided that I was going to charge nothing. Um, so there you go. So, but that's how you would set that up. 
Um, then down here, this is a lot of legal stuff that you will go through if you go through, like especially multiple representation, which I've already explained. Um, but you need to understand that the brokerage is representing you, not necessarily this realtor. So here's, here's why page two is important about some stuff. The finder's fee thing, I, I've never really had this even come up, but one of the most important things on page two has to do with the fact that you're in an agreement with Royal LePage Triland, not Mike Sloan. Mike Sloan just happens to be the representative of them on this. If Mike Sloan goes out and gets hit by a truck or decides I don't wanna do real estate anymore and I'm moving to BC and I'm kiteboarding for life, that contract is still stuck with Royal LePage if that realtor didn't negotiate a, a cancellation for you before he left. So you could still be stuck with them even without the person you agreed to sign up with. That's, and that's every real estate brokerage contract. Now, 99% of the time, that doesn't happen. But this year, I could give you an example of where it did. We had a listing in Forest with a realtor that left Royal LePage and went to somewhere. I can't remember where. And the broker didn't really like the way everything went, went down there, I guess. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. My brokers are all so freaking nice. I'm, I, that, that's hard to believe. I don't know how it got stuck there. I guess, I think it was actually the seller. She said, well, I don't want to switch. I don't want to switch brands. I signed up with Royal LePage. So I guess she didn't have a lot of allegiance to this realtor. And because it was closer to Grand Bend, I got stuck with the listing and then quickly realized that I was never going to get this price down to where it should be. I don't know how it ever got listed at that price to begin with. So I got her a cancellation. But the, but what happened was that the listing stayed with the brokerage and they shopped it around to whatever agents were close, closest to Forest, and I got the listing. But it was nothing but a bunch of work because it wasn't priced right, which is probably why the guy didn't fight to bring it over with him, right? And I really like the client. She's wonderful. But her partner didn't want to change the price and they were in a conflict. And when you have a corporation as your seller, everyone in the corporation has to agree. And if they never can, then it usually ends up in court. And I didn't want a listing like that. So, But you should be aware that you're represented by the brokerage. And that talks about that there. It talks about multiple representation. It talks about how the brokerage maybe receiving a finder's fee. So this may have been a referral, right? That, that, that was sent over and some of that commission might be going to some other realtor in some other town. And this gets into the details of that a little further. Um, it talks about marketing and that's the most marketing is ever discussed. So when you get clients and they start complaining that you didn't do aerial and that the, you need to be upfront about all this stuff at the very beginning. Because the language that's in there about marketing is basically like, yeah, we can put a sign up and you're going to be on some websites and we're going to talk about your property. That's it. So if you don't do enough, nobody can go and sue you for that. But you also might look pretty bad if you never really got into that discussion with the seller. So that to me is useless. I always sit down with my seller and say, I promise to do this, this, and this. And if they want me to promise it in writing, I add a schedule to the listing agreement and I put it in there. Uh, the seller warrants that... Um, there's nothing crazy going on with the property. There's no third party interest. There's no liens against it. So when they sign this, if it's later found out that that wasn't true and that they had like a second and a third private mortgage against it and all sorts of other stuff like that, that's not your fault because they're agreeing to this. So you need to make sure if you're not going to go through everything in the contract, that it's just brought up. You should have your house insured. There's all sorts of stuff in here. So I'm not going to read through every single clause, but you can see just after touching upon a few that I wanted to touch upon, it's not like it's not important stuff. And if you've never met anyone, you need to make sure they do understand it all. That is your job. Um, moving on to the next page, it's still discussing the, uh, the use and distribution of information. And there's a lot about privacy in there, about how the MLS works. And there's really not much they can do about having pictures of their house online unless they refuse to have any photos. But you can't list without a photo of the house. And that's a, that's a RICO requirement. You can't, in fact, you can't list without a photo of the outside of the house within at least the first five photos. They have some interesting rules about that. So there's gonna to have to be photos and information. Um, there's stuff in there about conflicts, there's stuff in there about electric, electronic signatures now. So you don't need the clause anymore. That this agreement and any agreements notices uh, may be transmitted, may be transmitted, sorry, electronically. And then I sign on behalf of the brokerage and then the seller sign, which happened to be me because I'm showing you my own agreement. Then, uh, yes, um, I have insurance through the Real Estate uh, Brokers and Business Act and the, the, like I have my RICO insurance, okay? And I'm the salesperson and I signed for that. And then I'm covered by errors, errors and omissions, which I'll mention in my notes again, so that if they give me the wrong information, 
So then there's this, okay? So this schedule is kind of unique to the London St. Thomas Real Estate Association. They have this special schedule that, it's weird, it talks about down here that the seller authorizes the listing brokerage to give a copy of this agreement to the seller's lawyer, to pay directly to the listing brokerage, any unpaid balance of commission, to, so that, which has nothing to do with including the legal description, but this is a means to always make sure the correct legal description is in there with your listing, even though it's dealing with some other stuff, which has to do with the signing responsibility of your listing to other organizations, because I can't post a listing sold, nor can the brokers. That's up to LSTAR, the London St. Thomas Real Estate Association. So, but this is where you put the legal description. So are you gonna take this from a previous listing? No, you're gonna go to the registry system, log in through your real estate broker's login and make sure it's exactly correct. And you're gonna copy and paste it character for character. And if it's not right in the registry system, that's not your fault, okay? If you paste an incorrect legal description from the previous realtor, you're just showing that you were too lazy to take the extra two minutes to go into registry and get the right one. So I always check. And the same thing is very, very true when you get to the data input form. So this is where all the information goes. Okay, so if I go back into my, you can't see my listing anymore um, on realtor.ca because it's sold, okay? It's not like Zillow or some of these sites in the States that keep showing it and tell you how much it's sold for. Once it's sold, it's gone, it's out of the database, but it's still in the board's listings. So when I go to my listing here, this is what it looked like. All these fields here, the year built, all this different stuff, what type of house it is. And I'm not gonna go through every field. We have no time for that, but it, it's all the little details that go into the listing here. All of that will be filled in here. Okay, including the tax roll number and the PIN, which we didn't used to require. So a lot of realtors prior to the new form of this, which only came out just a couple years ago, they never even went into registry and looked it up, but it's as easy as this. Like if you're logged in to your board login, that's what this is, okay? This is my board login. You guys won't have access to something like this. You go to Geo Warehouse, which is the digital version of TerraNet for realtors, appraisers. I, don't, I think lawyers actually have access to a different version of it that provides um, the deeds and all the titles without having to pay a fee every time. It's like a subscription-based thing. It, it, depends on, it depends on the area too, it depends on the province. So I, this is only for Ontario. I can't look up what somebody bought in BC because I don't have access to that registry system. It's per province. So if I wanted to look up, for example, how much, uh, hmm, I have to be very careful here. Well, I'll use my house again. We'll see if it's closed yet. So this, this will bring up, so my house, and here's another issue I have with registry, right? So the street name and the municipality's mapping shows Joanne being spelled as one word. But somewhere along the way, somebody got it in there as two words. So registry is actually inaccurate in the way that it's spelled. And typically you're always supposed to put in exactly what registry has, but I, I lived on the street. So I know for a fact, even, even in their own mapping, it's one word, okay? So there's my house. I can switch to satellite view. This is all gonna be, like this is gonna be fast here. I'm not gonna ask you questions about all the things that registry offers. Um, okay, Ariel, see my house there? You know, that's a pretty old picture. Um, well, maybe not. It's got my new shed and stuff. So that shows the sale of what I sold my house for in November. Oh my God, Mike, you can't just share that information with. If you guys wanted to know how much I sold my house for, all you'd have to go down, all you'd have to do is go down to the local registry office that includes Grand Bend, which is in Sarnia, and individually as, a, as just a private citizen and not a licensed realtor, just pay the fee for, um, and maybe I should pull their names off there a little bit, um, just pay the fee for what it costs to get the record, and the record's yours, okay? So if you scroll down a little bit, you can see it, it provides the PIN number. If I scroll back up, it would have provided the, the tax roll number, the ARN, the assessment roll number. Okay, these are things that need to go into the listing in our board. Um, I can look around, I can see what's in the neighborhood. Hey, who's got their blue boxes on my property? That's funny. This is an old picture, because we've had bins now for like five years, four years. So this is a pretty old photo. In fact, my garage is open and Rich's truck is in the driveway. This is funny. Um, he's my former real estate partner who used to help me out with a lot of stuff. So, uh, 
Okay, so if you scroll down a bit further, and I'm trying to turn this on and off, it'll give you precise sizing, but measurements that are not precise. So I've always found that with this, this is actually accurate, but these measurements they have in here in the mapping are not, it's weird. So this is taken right from the registry, but these are based on like satellite positioning and GPS and they're not always right on. So this actually shows my property being a lot smaller than it is, um, but that's the proper measurement in square feet. If you go into the store, you can buy reports for eight bucks that show the year built, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms. You don't have to trust the other realtor. And that might not be accurate either because they might have done stuff in the house without a building permit but that at least shows the year built and stuff like that. So you can go into registry and get that information. Can you guys access any of this without a license? No, that's why I don't wanna to spend too much time getting into the details and the process. Um, I just wanted you to see how it works. So as I said, right before I got into web forms, I said, so some people still do print it out and write it all out. I never ever do that now. Everything I do is digital. I fill in all the information in here. I type it all in. I'm still using the, using the old version of web forms. The new one's supposed to be even faster. But I just, um, I gotta sit down and I'm, I'm all about the new stuff. I always wanna transition to the new one. I've just been too busy to sit down and go through the differences and I'm so used to this. So I just keep using this one. Um, and this one's really only been around for a couple years. So. You check off, see, okay, look, see all these check boxes? So it's not just like the house and the rooms and how they're measured. What are the services? Cable, electronics, fiber optics. You need to know the right answers to these questions. And of course, if you screw it up, you have errors and omissions insurance, but still, you wanna provide people, especially buyers, an accurate representation of what you're trying to sell. And that's what all these fields are for. And you don't just wanna leave stuff blank. In fact, the form won't even let you. If it's filled in bold, it, will, it makes you put stuff in. Um, what is the water service? It's municipal. It's on, whoa, that's not right. It's on septic. Um, but I'm pretty sure I had septic in the listing. Why did I do that? See, and this is the difference between um, doing, yeah, I did. I did have septic. I don't know why, but that's not going to matter. What matters is what you advertise to the public. Huh. And I didn't, I didn't, my own house, I didn't have my listing docs ready right away because it was my own house, right? So I listed it without the listing docs, because I can post with broker load without the listing docs, knowing in good faith there was an agreement because I'm my own realtor. That's the only time I would ever do that. Um, but that's why I made a small mistake there like that. So you check off all the boxes that are applicable. You don't have to put the room measurements in here. You can put them directly into the MLS. So I hardly ever bother to type them in there twice. It's just more typing. That's literally how busy people get. I don't have to type the room measurements in there twice. And then this. Remember the thousand characters that we get in, in the London St. Thomas board? There it is, okay? Two, uh, how many more spaces do I have left? Four, I was, that's usually, that's a lot for me. Usually if I had four characters left, I'd do something at the end like this, wow. <laughs> Fill it up, fill it up, all right? And then this is what you get for realtor remarks, but this is a little wonky. The amount of space they give you here is actually less than you get when you go to input it in here. So I'll show you how that works too, okay? So if I were to go in here and I wanted all that information to transfer right from this form, it doesn't work like that. Once you get the agreement signed, you have to go into your board's login, which is probably gonna look a little different than mine if you're not working in the London area. You go to add a new listing, whatever it is, residential, commercial, farm, and then you have all this stuff. You, you fill in the area, you get to the next thing, you fill in all the, just, just a fill in the blank type of thing that looks similar to this, but the fields are slightly different. Like you can get, I can fit more in here um, on the matrix system, that's the matrix here, than I can here. Okay, and then this is the good stuff, your commission. Can you change the, is the commission different if there's two real, so here's the question where it's asked, is there an altered listing contract on a double-ended Thing. And every one of mine says yes, because I charge people less if there's two. And if there's multiple offers, will I still charge them less? Yes. Too bad. Tell your buyer to come directly to me. And I, I don't ever think like that. I want to work with the other realtors. They make deals easier. They facilitate things. It's a better experience for everyone, typically, if there are two realtors involved, even the seller. So I was happy as heck when this particular realtor who sold my house brought me a deal, even though I was making quite a bit less money because she'd qualified the client, she'd done all this stuff, as, and that's, that's a really good segue into the next set of paperwork, okay? So back to the notes here. 
what we've seen is that there's all this information about what's what. Now, the one thing that didn't come up at all in the listing document, and you need to, this is why you need to understand it when you're listing a place, is HST. So this is a huge deal. I do not have time to fit it into one podcast. In fact, I don't want to lecture it because it's so freaking boring. There's tons of information on it everywhere. The federal government has over-informed people to the nines about how this works with real estate, and it's pretty easy to get the information. I put a collection of that in a set of notes on FOL for you, and I will ask you a few questions about that on the test, about how HST works and when it's applicable, and I'll talk about it briefly here. Because what bugs me is that there's nothing in the listing agreement that would encourage you guys to ask about HST if you're signing up a listing. Now, who knows how much HST is? Don't look at the screen, just tell me. 13, yes, everybody in Ontario knows that, it sucks. It's one of the highest in the country. There's a, there's a lot that are still around six to eight, right? Michigan six, that's another country, but whatever. Oregon zero. There's a lot of stuff I still buy on amazon.com where I don't have to pay sales tax. Because if the product is not warehoused or has any connection to the state of Michigan, I don't have to pay sales tax, it's freaking awesome. All the kiteboarding gear I ever bought and sold in my store came out of Oregon, no sales tax, <laughs> literally. And then I get to charge tax when I have to charge tax when I sell it. So HST is something that, it, it, we have GST, right? GST is the 5% component of HST. PST, which is the provincial sales tax, those two together, they called the harmonized sales tax because it was no longer just HST that was applicable to newer stuff and commercial stuff. It was the whole thing. So if there's a commercial property that's selling for millions of dollars, and somebody wants to buy it without an HST number, this is what's really important, they will have to pay 13% on that. It's 130 grand every million. But for people that are in commercial real estate and are, are selling and buying commercial and they have an HST number associated with this, associated with this, it's kind of a non-issue because when they, buy, this is hard to explain, it's more of a lawyer discussion, but when they buy it, there's HST that's applicable to it that they can immediately just wrap back through their corporation as an input tax credit and it just cancels itself out. So as long as something that's commercial stays commercial and people who are commercial keep buying it, there's no HST issue. So I'll give you an example of when this really came up huge. I, I wanted to list, so I had a hotel for sale in Grand Bend called the Bonnie Dune. All it is is a big old freaking cottage that somebody broke into a bunch of rooms and made it a hotel. That's all it is. It's, it's like, it's not a hotel, okay? But in terms of use and zoning, it is. And in the, mid, in the early 90s, when they redid the zoning bylaw around Grand Bend, this took on commercial zoning, which pretty much they didn't really care about until 2011 came around. And then they realize, wow, when I go to sell this now, nobody, no residential buyers are gonna be even remotely interested because unless they get an HST number and keep it commercial, they're gonna have to charge HST for all the rents. So it's an HST nightmare because it's sitting in the middle of a market where everybody is doing a short-term residential rental. There's no HST, it's residential rental. You still have to file like income taxes on it, right? You still have to claim it but it's not a commercial operation because the people are staying as guests in your house. There just isn't any HST. It's residential. HST is very much attached to commercial. So there's all these weird situations where things might have gone better if there wasn't HST. But ultimately, the person I sold it to was another person with a numbered company, like a corporation, and they had an HST number, so it was a non-issue. But now they're like, oh man, I want the residential setbacks. I want this to just be a house. And in order to do that, they have to rezone it and pay the HST to get it out of that zoning. So it's, it's tricky, okay? New houses are HST applicable that have never been lived in. And sometimes the builder just builds the HST into the price. A used house is not. So that gets into all these gray areas where builders are building houses, renting them for three months, and then selling them as a used house. Because that way, they don't have to charge HST, and they don't have to incorporate and pay to, ha to have Terry and warranty coverage, which Terry and warranty coverage, which I don't even talk about in any of my notes because I don't believe that it's really a good program. Uh, only because I've had friends of mine that have bought brand new houses where serious stuff happened like a few years in and they're like, oh, sorry, that's only covered in the first year. That's only covered in the first couple of years. And, and like, but this is a serious issue because it's a seven year warranty 
But after the first year, a lot of that stuff drops off, right? Um, so there are builders that don't believe in that program too. And I, I honestly, the builders that honor the Tarian warranty and they, they're very good about it, it's, it's not a terrible program, but that's another reason builders are trying to avoid selling houses that would be brand new. It's not even because of the HST issue, because the HST kind of just washes through if you build it in the price of the house. But then there's all these situations with vacant land, right? So pretty much anything commercial, there's HST no matter what. Okay, then as soon as you step away from that, realtors never know when to charge it. They never understand it. So I want you to look at those notes. There's a whole list of, uh, farm is not HST unless it's being sold as a commercial operation. If it's being transferred from one family member to another, there's no HST. Vacant land, even if somebody owns it who has an HST number, they don't have to charge HST if their intention when they bought it was to build their own house there and then they just sold it to somebody else to do the same thing if it was a used lot. If it's a brand new lot that's been created since HST came about in 2011, I think it was, doesn't matter when it was because it's there now. We're not getting away from it. If it was a brand new lot, okay, they would have to charge HST because it hasn't put the HST into the system yet. If they can't sell it with the HST on top of it, they just have to lower the price. So it, it is 13%. I mean, so you're buying a lot for $100,000. It's $13,000, okay? Okay, so um, the HST thing should come up with the people you're listing with so that it doesn't become a huge issue when you have buyers step up, okay? If it's a used house or resale lot, and it, the key is that it's, this is where it gets into a gray area, is if, if, even if someone owns a used house, if they own it and they have an HST number and their operation of it was in any way could be considered a commercial endeavor, they have to charge HST. And if they don't want to list it like that, which they never would, they just have to pay it out of the sales, out of the sale of the house. They have to pay it 1300. 13, so 13,000 dollars on 100 grand, that's a pretty big deal if you're buying a lot. So if a builder has purchased the lot to develop, and then they didn't, but that was their intention, the idea is that when they go to sell it, HST should be applicable. If they purchased the lot because they were going to build a house there. So my wife and I purchased property in the back of our subdivision where my house used to be. And from the bottom of my heart, like our intention was that we were going to build back there. And then we realized that we could divide the property up and sell it. And I don't have an HST number for that kind of stuff. So we just, we just sold the lots and, and they were resale lots. They were already separate lots. Okay. But we were going to combine them all and build on this big, like one and a half acre thing. And so I bought all the lots with that intention. And then, so I didn't have to pay HST, nor will I, if they try and track me down and say, you should have paid HST because I know what the rules are. Okay. But if I had an HST number and my intention was to build a house on each of those lots and I was a, a developer, see that's, if I even built one house and sold it instead of just selling the lots, I bet they could get me. But I, there's just no reason why I would have had to charge HST because once we realized that we wanted to be closer to the beach, there, there, the whole story has reasons behind everything. So, and we didn't own it in a numbered company. So that, that would have given it a gray area spot too. But even if I bought it in a corporation, I still shouldn't have had to pay HST based on my intentions. So as you can see, this is not an easy thing to tackle but I will ask you some basic questions on it, probably right out of the notes or stuff I've talked about here. Um, not a lot of realtors get, when a lot of realtors just think anytime there's vacant land, there's HST, especially ones in the city, because usually when lots come up for sale, they're part of a new development and they're just like the, the infill lots that they didn't get to developing. And they've never been sold since they've been cut up into a lot, which means there will be HST, even if the person that owns it didn't have an HST number. I don't know why that would happen, but so, so then, City realtors get this thing in their head like anytime there's a vacant land sale, there's HST, but there isn't. Not anytime. Even, even if the owner has an HST number. So it's, it's a big, huge freaking deal in real estate. And with a used house, it'll never come up. But if for some reason that used, I'm trying to sell a house in Watford right now. It's the most screwed up thing ever. I'll, I'll tell you this quick story. It's a house. I'll, I'll show it to you. Um, and they don't say anything about it in the listing, and I think we're going to be able to get it through. I probably shouldn't even talk about it in here, but 
Um, trying to get an offer in on this. Oh, great. It's got an offer on it. Uh, when did that happen? See what? See all the information I can find out? Um, it was posted November 25th. That's today with an offer. The guy didn't call me. Uh, wow, I'll be calling him. He works in the same office as me, too. We, we do a lot of favors for each other where we kind of say like, hey, I'm really working hard on this buyer. You got to let me know if there's anything going on. So much for that. So anyway, this place, and it's not in the listing, and I'm not trying to indicate that by any means this person is not doing a great job, but I can scroll down a little bit here. Just like new, never lived in. Um, this lovely three bedroom, two level home is waiting for someone like a starter, a starter home to retire. Blah, blah, blah. So the lot is a resale lot. It was a residential lot that changed hands a few times. There's no HST there. The house is a model home that was put together at a subdivision complex, like about probably 20 kilometers away and was lifted up and moved here. So I called a lawyer today and I said, what's going on with this just today? And now there's an offer on it. Um, like how is HST going to be applicable here? And he said, well, that's a really tough one because if where it was at before people lived in it, which I heard there was so, and that's a good thing. He says never lived in. I know a lot of people from this area. So they said, oh yeah, they had somebody renting it out in the subdivision. So that's good. So that means it's a used home, but it's owned by the numbered company that did the development, which means there was never any intention here of living in it unless they were willing to say, well, our intention was we, we figured we move the model home to Watford and just live in it. So here's a really, who knows, right? And you have to talk to a lawyer. So my lawyer did say, he said, here's the, here's the biggest X factor. If as a builder, they collected their input tax credit from all the HST they spent when they built this, there's no way there's not going to be HST on it. But the buyer probably does not know that because nobody looks into this to the degree that I do. So that deal will probably fall through and my guy will still get it, I, I hope. But wow, that's, see, see, you learn stuff all the time when you're watching me show you things. So that's, that's interesting. Um, 40 hour to, oh, okay. All right, that's no big deal. Um, 48 hour escape clause financing and the sale of the buyer's property. So these are the conditions that it has on it. When this comes up financing, there's gonna be questions about HST here. Well, only if they know that it's been moved here as a brand new house from somewhere else. I would say there'd be questions because it says never lived in. But it says here, built in 2012, which I, I also heard it was built in 2010, not 2012. Um, and it seems like 2010 when you're in there. Uh, that, that was a mistake to put that in the listing. And I'm not going to show you the realtor's name. He's actually a good realtor. The guy's usually on top of stuff. Although, what do we say about this description? What do we say as a class about this description? Short. Not yes. What the heck? Tell me about the house. Like, what are the bathrooms like? Like, is, are they big rooms? Are they small rooms? What do you mean just like new? I don't even get it. Like, where is it? It's actually in a pretty cool location. Um, it's kind of across from the fire hall, but not in a busy area. And really close to the schools. You could walk to the schools. Why doesn't it say walk to the schools? Like, it doesn't say that. It, it just, I don't know. Whatever. I don't want to pick the thing apart here, but... It's, this is going to be an issue. This deal will not go through because the HST is going to come up. Now, they could go after the buyer. Well, here's, okay, this is a perfect time to go to the next agreement. So here's the next agreement. All right, the offer package requires a lot more information up front on the first page. And then you start to get into a bunch of other details on the latter pages. So the offer agreement looks like this. And it's between... Um, Buyer and seller here. So now we're on to the buyer representation versus customer, in terms of the agreement, checking the details. So these are some of the points I wanna hit when I'm going through here. Um, if you're already representing the seller, you don't have to represent the buyer. You can simply say, are you okay with customer service because my seller really doesn't want me doing multiple representation? Or what you should say is, do you want me to get another realtor involved and then you'd have to pay them a fee? Or you should just ask them. Here, read this about multiple representation versus customer service, which would you rather have? And we'll talk more about that in week 14. I, I, I do a whole little spiel on that because you have fiduciary responsibilities, as I mentioned last week, to your clients. You have to tell them everything. You have to go out of your way to tell them stuff even if they don't ask about it. 
Customers, if they ask about it, you can't lie to them, but you don't owe them all that. And this includes grow ops, which I just found out about, which is remarkable. Since the legalization of marijuana, unlike it was before, where you, you had to disclose in the listing if a house had been a grow op, but it's not because of the illegal activity that had been going on there. The reason for the disclosure was because of the damage it can cause to a house, because of the humidity and because when people would do grow ups in a house before, the entire house would be a grow up and it'd just be sopping and falling apart. Now that it's legal, people can actually set up proper tents that don't damage the rest of their house. Okay, I'm not a pot smoker, but this is what I've heard. Um, I'm more of a beer kind of guy, but anyway, so I don't really care. You know what? I wanted it to be legal before too, and I never even smoked it because it was stupid that it wasn't. How many times do you hear about like a bunch of guys outside a bar that were super stoned getting in a huge fight? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, several area men who were heavily intoxicated beat the crap out of each other last night. That's what you hear, right? So the legalization of marijuana, however, somehow got Rico totally okay with the fact that a house had been a grow up. And now if the question is asked that it was a grow up, you need to answer it honestly, but otherwise you don't have to disclose it in the listing. And very few realtors actually go back in the listing history and look at what was disclosed in previous listings. Most do not. So I have a buddy looking at Lucan right now, and I'm like, wow, that seems like a lot of money since the last time it was sold. So I go back to the last time it was sold, and it was a freaking bank sale grow up. So not only was it, was it a grow up, it was an abandoned derelict house. And when I look at the photos, I'm like, it doesn't even look that different. Like, I wonder if they've remediated for mold. I wonder how much they really cleaned it up. Like this house was a grow up. So I got on the realtor about it, and felt like a total jackass because I didn't realize the rule had changed after legalization. And you don't, and, and I had to apologize to the guy because I'm like, oh, realtors like you, you know, like, and I never do this. I was so unprofessional with the guy. This was just a couple weeks ago. And I'm like, I'm so sick of people being lazy in listings, not putting, he didn't put it in there because he doesn't have to. And neither would have I because holy crap, if you don't have to disclose it, you better not disclose something like that because people will come to all sorts of conclusions about the house if it but if they ask you you have to tell them okay if they were in a buyer agreement with me long story short now i would have to tell them no matter what okay if they were in a buyer agreement with me all right so i don't know i don't know i, I it's a tough situation at times. You don't have to represent your buyers in a contract. You don't have to, but my brokerage is always telling me just get buyer reps. You don't, so the purpose of the buyer representation agreement is usually to set it up so that if you're gonna be out with the buyer for months and months, that eventually if they buy something that's unlisted, you still get a commission. But I've never done that to anybody. I always just make them, I always make the buyer rep specific to that property and put down zero commission no matter what. I've only had one person ever that I put into an area buyer rep and I still didn't hold them to commission on stuff they just bought without me because I, I actually helped them with it. I just didn't. So it's, it's more to protect the buyer and you and the relationship you're in. But if you're already representing the seller, so this is a big question with purchase of sale agreements is if you're already representing the seller, should you represent the buyer? Or should you get another realtor? I, I'm not going to give you guys an answer to that. It, it just depends on the situation, right? So in the buyer rep, you could be getting commission, even though it's a buyer and they could be, they could pay you commission. There are very rare occasions where that happens. Can you do customer service? Um, if you have the listing for sure, you can just say, I don't want to, can you do customer service for a listing though? Um, not that I'm aware of. If you're going to list a property, you need the agreement. So once you get, so the, the whole offer side of things then is a lot less formal. I, I meet people all the time that make offers and then I never get to talk to them again. It's weird because they might be interested in the property that I'm selling and that's it. And they're the kind of people that go directly to realtors. So remember that you get a lot of those and it's really good for you if you can nail them down. Um, but I never ask them to sign buyer reps. To me, that's like saying, I'm not confident enough in my skills and my level of service that I feel like I need you to sign this to make sure if I forget to call you, you'll just call me anyway. I don't make people sign it. So, and remember the multiple representation thing where if you have two realtors from the same brokerage, even though it's two different realtors, that's still multiple representation. That will be dual agency no matter what. Um, okay, and then the other thing, and this is another thing realtors never do. They just, oh, you wanna write up an offer? Let's write it up, cool, sounds good. 
why don't you ask them if they've spoken to a mortgage broker? Do you have a job? Oh, you don't? Oh, you got laid off. Oh, no, you were terminated because of uh, insubordination? What does that even mean? Like, what? Wow, okay. I wouldn't write that offer up as a cash offer. Are you nuts? A cash means... There's no conditions for them to go talk about a mortgage and get, so there's a lot of things on the buyer side that are totally different than the seller side. So why is that still in there? That shouldn't be in there. Um, so let's go take a look at that one, okay? Offer package. So the basics, right? What's the date, buyer, seller? What's the address? Where is it? How, what's the frontage? So a lot of the stuff that went into the input for the other realtors listing, that goes on to the front page. So you understand what the property is all about. Uh, the purchase price they're offering, not the price they have it listed at, the price they're offering. Don't offer $20 as a deposit. So the deposit, just to explain how this works, you offer them a price and down at the bottom of the page is when the completion date is. See down here, right here? That's the closing date, okay? That's important because the listing agent will have put in there how, how much time they want to close. You don't wanna push them around on this if you're not offering a good price. So in London right now, the big game is if something's vacant, it's just been renovated, you know the guy wants to move on to the next one, they try and get the best price by giving them like a really fast closing, right? Where if people are in there and winter's coming, they might not want to close now until like the end of February. So that should be in the listing and you want to pay attention to the details of the listing when you're doing this so that you don't, um, you know, just so you don't mess it up. So uh, the deposit though is... If you have, so here, let's jump to here. So let's let's zoom out a little bit. I'm gonna go all the way to the end of the agreement and then to this page called Schedule A. So there's always Schedule A. No matter what, you might have a Schedule B and a C and you might have different stuff going on with your brokerage. Schedule B could be for like a brokerage trust account where they're earning interest on their money. Schedule C could just be for extra stuff. You could have a schedule that you called Schedule L because it includes leases. You can call it whatever you want. Anything that's pertinent to the deal can go into a schedule. So in this schedule A is where you'll put, this deal is conditional. So this agreement is conditional upon me talking to the bank and making sure I can get the money for 10 days. So if 10 days pass and you do not fulfill that condition by filling out another form, which is down here at the bottom of the file I gave you, uh, not the very bottom, but notice of fulfillment. You just take the condition you put in Schedule A and you repeat it right here. And you say, okay, now, six days later, dated at Grand Bend, Ontario, whatever, this condition is fulfilled. Now the deal is firm. That means you're buying it for sure. And if you don't, you're going to get sued. This deposit up here, let's say you made it five grand. What's going to happen is if you don't come through on your conditions, if you say, I can't buy the thing, just let it fall apart, you get all that money back. If you fulfill the conditions and then you get to the end of February and you don't buy the property because in between then you gambled all your money away, I've seen it, okay? And literally it was that. The guy had literally gambled all the family's money into oblivion and they couldn't buy the house. And they got sued. Because why wouldn't you sue the person that's already down? Like you could just say, screw it, keep the deposit, right? But here's the thing. The deposit is made out to the listing brokerage, the listing real estate brokerage, okay? Sometimes the lawyer, sometimes there's different stuff going on. When you get to the point, if conditions aren't fulfilled, the buyer's getting the deposit back no matter what, right? When you get to the point where conditions were fulfilled and then three months went by and the property didn't close, very often the seller will refuse to release the deposit. So after a deal goes firm, you have a form called a mutual release. I'm not showing you that one. It's just a one page form. It's called a mutual release. And the mutual release, I'm probably not gonna test you on that either, but it's both parties have to agree where the deposit money goes to. So what happens when a buyer has screwed somebody over, like a seller, by not closing on a property three months later, and now in three months, you could see the market actually go down. They're like, oh man, now it's the middle of the winter. Like I got to hold this house for another three more months until the snow melts and then I can sell it. Who knows what I'm going to get then? Markets change in a month. Markets change all the time. They're always up and down. So that guy might end up having to sell the house for 20 grand less and then he can keep the deposit and, well, he, here's the thing. He can't keep the, the deposit's really funny. So the deposit can get stuck with a real estate brokerage forever and nobody can have the money if they can't get both parties to agree where it should go. Isn't that hilarious? You could have a $100,000 deposit just sitting there doing nothing. Now, 
That's usually because the seller plans to sue the buyer for the, the, the difference between the price they ended up selling it for and the price that the buyer originally offered maybe eight months before. And then the deposit can come out of that ordered by a judge, right? So now I'm getting into a lot, way too many details, but bottom line, that's how the deposit works. And even if you have an offer with conditions, I wanna do a home inspection and I'm not gonna say for sure I'm gonna buy this house until I get the home inspection report back. You know what a lot of people do now? They, they offer a stupid price just to make sure they lock it up. And then they do a home inspection, find a bunch of crap in it and say, oh, we gotta take 10 grand off. They knew they were gonna do that the whole time. They just got a home inspector to make sure they put a bunch of stuff in the report, right? So conditions are often used in negative ways, but most of the time they're there because the buyers need that reassurance. So in the States, these are called contingencies. Whenever markets get busy, you see offers with a lot less conditions. If the house is only eight years old and you go in and everything seems fine, there's no water coming in the basement, how much could really be wrong with it, right? I mean, home inspectors can't exactly start peeling back the walls. They can only do so much. So, but the conditions do lock up a deal. So this deal now is conditional. Uh, where'd that 521 Ontario Street? Um, because it has a financing clause, okay? Once, they're once they determine they're gonna be able to get a mortgage on this property if they sell their house, then it actually switches back to an active listing because it just has an escape clause deal on it. So it has a condition that makes this, the purchase of this conditional upon the sale of the buyer's house, which to me isn't really an offer. I mean, you could offer 400,000. It doesn't really matter if you can't sell, you know, your crappy overpriced house, <laughs> right? So th this house isn't crappy though. This is a cool house. I like it. It's priced well. I'm not surprised it has an offer. This, this would have come in after it expired because it expired on November 12th and then this came back up. Um, anyway, so, Oh, that's annoying. Uh, so, but I like that this stuff happens right in the middle of my class because it's kind of cool. Like you always got to be checking things and be on top of things. Um, next page, what's included? Washer, dryer, stove, fridge, all that kind of stuff. Any fixtures that are ex excluded? What do you mean fixtures? Anything that's attached to a house. If you took a house and flipped it upside down and shook it, anything that doesn't fall out of it is included unless the sellers remember to exclude it. So you can't walk in there and have them have taken some giant, super expensive chandelier that was a family heirloom and tough crap for them because it was the showpiece in that room and it should have stayed there unless they put it in the agreement as an exclusion. So there's a place when you do the listing where that stuff should be, right? And then you can put it in the listing. Uh, hot water heater is a very common rental item. Once in a while, a furnace. I like to see none there because Union Gas and Reliance work together on this rental thing that's just the biggest ripoff ever. There it is, HST. So HST only comes up in the offer, okay? And this is where you need to have a good understanding of what's going on. And if you're not sure, and you're representing the buyer, always just put included in. Because then if HST was applicable and the seller's realtor or lawyer didn't catch it, you're, you're off the hook anyway if you have included in in there. So it's either gonna be included in or... I have had deals where the other realtor had such a lack of understanding of HST that I knew it was okay for them to put in addition to because my seller would, I knew my buyer wouldn't have to pay it because it, it reads here, if HST is applicable, it will be included in or in addition to. So I knew it wasn't going to be applicable, so they were safe. At the top of the next page is when the lawyer has to search the title by. So technically speaking, even after the buyer has removed all their buyer conditions, Every offer in Ontario technically is still a conditional offer because if the lawyer searches title and there's like three people on title that weren't mentioned in the listing and there's all these issues and liens against the property, it's not gonna close. But the idea with the listing agreement is that all of that has already been dealt with. So the title search generally, I've, I've had issues on a title search one time. Oh, oh no, twice, because it happened on a property that I bought actually. There, the lawyer was great. He found an issue with the title and where it drew the lines for the property and where the lines actually were. And we had to get a survey fixed and my property was actually bigger than I thought it was. And they made somehow the realtor for the last neighbor had to pay for that. I don't know how that happened, but it was a really strange situation, but it didn't cost me any money. And, um, oh no, it was the realtor. Yeah, that was it. My seller side had to pay for it because I was buying the property. 
but the previous realtor had given them a bad survey because they'd never bothered to check with the lawyer to see if it was right, and the lawyer didn't either. The lawyer should have been. And then there's a bunch of legal stuff going through these pages. I'm not going to go through every one of these. There's like UFFI was a UFI was a product they were putting in houses late 70s, early 80s that can be that'll kill you if you breathe in the fumes if you're in a fire there. So it's little things like that that have to be represented automatically. Um, time limits, residency is a big deal. My parents being from the states, that was a ongoing issue with them getting their money back. And then the signing page where everybody agrees and they put their lawyers at the bottom. So you'll be taught your way through this and they will spend probably just as much time, um, or sorry, they'll probably spend, yeah, well, yeah, just as much time on the offer to purchase as they will on the listing agreements that ha often, very often have way more pages because of all the data input. Because this is where you're gonna be held more accountable if something's messed up. If you list a house, and there's a couple little issues there. You're covered in error and, errors and omissions, and if it never sells, big deal. You're not really held to anything, right? Well, you don't make any money if it doesn't sell. Um, you could be stuck if you tell this guy, if the guy tells you it's a hot water heater rental, okay? And and it, it's made it's been made very clear to you, and the information was provided to you that it was a hot water heater rental, and then the buyers, um, no, no, sorry, other way around that it was not a hot water heater rental. So then the buyers put in there none. The agreement went through the whole process. Your seller didn't notice that it said none. It's not his job, it's your job. And then they get into the house and they say, hey, this is a rental. That's not what the agreement of purchase and sale said. So that's beyond errors and omissions. That's just a glaring mistake. And you as the realtor that screwed it up would likely have to buy those buyers a hot water heater just so you know. You can try and get out of it through errors and omissions, but that's gonna be one where if it's, if it's made obvious to you and it was in the listing agreement that it was a rental and then you just accidentally put it in that it wasn't, they could even say that you did that because it makes the listing more attractive and you just figure, you'd figure it out later. So I had a situation like that, and I'm admitting this, where I, didn't, I automatically thought that it was not a rental because it was an on-demand hot water heater and I hadn't seen those as rentals yet. So I never even asked the seller. I just never asked him. And he assumed that me as his responsible listing realtor would have gone and looked at it and seen the union, the Reliance sticker right on it and there's an agreement and everything. And then the buyer buys it and the agreement was all set and firm and it was a week from closing. And the agreement was that there was not a hot water heater rental. And then it turned out when they found out there was that she actually preferred that and didn't realize how much of a ripoff it is because she, well, there's a reason. Maybe she knows how expensive it is, but she's still happy to pay for that so that if anything ever goes wrong, they are immediately there to fix it. That's the advantage of having the rental hot water heater. Okay, so I was covered, I was safe. And now it's closed and done and they agreed to close it that way and there's been trans, uh, transmissions. There's been communication in writing that it was a rental and they acknowledge that they were okay with it. So then I'm okay. They can't come back and sue me now. Um, but you gotta be careful with these details. It's all about details, okay? Then you get to Schedule A and that's where you say on every agreement, the buyer agrees to pay the balance of the purchase price as such, right? Which is usually just the money will be transferred through the large value transfer system on the day of closing. Sometimes the buyer convinces the seller to, to hold a mortgage so the seller actually carries a mortgage on the house that they're selling, and that clause would be a little different, but that'll be the beginning of every Schedule A. And that's not a condition, that's like a term of the agreement. Then is where you put, we want the seller to make sure the yard's cleaned up before closing, and that doesn't have to be a condition, that can be a term. And then if you get to closing and the yard's full of junk, the lawyers talk to each other and they have to come clean it up. They have to, it's part of the contract. And that's also where you can put the conditions, like, the buyer has to go and make sure they can get a mortgage. So now, even if you've already been pre-approved, most lenders and banks are telling you, well, don't just go buy a house with no mortgage condition though, because we never really know for sure, because houses are going so high over price that when the mortgage company gets the appraisal back, it's way more, or it's way less than they're actually paying. They're paying way more than the appraisal, and they have to try and make them cover the difference. They're not gonna pay more for the house, they're just gonna pay the same price, but the bank might only mortgage it. Let's say the house was 330 and these guys ended up paying 360, and then an appraisal came back and said the house was only worth 310. 
the bank will only mortgage it up to 310 and the buyers will have to, if they want to buy the house, they're not going to have to pay more for it, but they'll have to pay more up front. They'll have to pay the difference between 310 and 360. So that's why even if you're pre-approved in markets where everything's going over price, like over asking price, you still want a finance clause to make sure everything's okay. As long as the bank gets that appraisal back and it's in line with the price you're paying and you were approved to pay up to that price, then you should be fine. Right? So there's a lot, guys, holy crap. Like I'm not even close to scratching the surface on all this stuff and look what, like we're almost done, right? There's a lot of moving pieces here, an enormous amount. And the agreement of purchase and sale um, will always work together with those schedules and you could add more schedules and then you'll have a really important document called confirmation of cooperation, which I'm not going to spend a ton of time on. It's right here. That's where you identify who's working for whom and how they're getting paid and how much. So that's an important one. It's two pages. Then you'll have the buyer rep, okay, which is what I said. If you're representing the seller as well, you don't have to do a buyer rep. You don't have to do a buyer rep even if you're not representing the seller. But this is where you might identify that there's some commission associated, associated and we're down here on the top of the second page. I always just put zero. Okay, so the buyer reps like that. That's only a few pages. This thing they used to make us include all the time. It just explains what a realtor does and what kind of relationship they have with consumers, with customers, with clients. It defines the difference. I'm going to use this in week 14 when we talk about the difference between customers and clients because it, it provides a nice, concise definition. I never use it anymore. The less papers, the better, right? It just confuses people to add more papers. But a lot of the realtors that have been doing this for 25, 30 years, they insist that this has to be used when it's not a requirement. So I just wanted to give you a heads up in case you run into that, you don't have to use it. And then this. So this is a big freaking deal, okay? FinTrack, okay, this is an individual identification form. They also have receipt of funds forms. They have corporate identification forms. They have all these identification forms where you have to show your brokerage that you have sat down with these people in person, taken a picture of their ID, obtained proper documentation on corporations and power of attorney and all that stuff, and you have identified them and, and verified their identity and where they're from and checked off all these boxes indicating what the transaction is about, if they're selling or buying, what they're doing. And that's for the federal government if they were ever to come asking about it, okay? That's a huge deal. So you have to, we're gonna talk about that in a second. And then there's that notice of fulfillment form, which is a single page form. There's an amendment form, which is a two page form. If you have to change something in an agreement of purchase and sale, there's about 350, 400 different forms you have access to in web forms. It is nuts. What I'm giving you today is your crash course on the likely documents you will encounter in your first year. Okay, and FinTrack is a huge one. And that's why once we get through kind of the quick review of how all this stuff works, we get to FinTrack, okay? So I have some links here and I'm gonna give you the quick breakdown on what it is, okay? And I, I expect you to have at least looked at those links. They'll all be in your notes separately. When, when you go to study for the final test, even for my face-to-face -face students, I'm gonna transfer all the information I have for my online students over to your FOL so you have all the same details. Okay, so you will have these links offered separately outside of the PDFs so you don't have to go through digging around. Um, there's a brochure there. It's, there's a Rico story about FinTrack, which is really good. It's about this guy who didn't properly FinTrack somebody and then he was held liable for something. It's, but the bottom line is this is a federal government program in Canada. I, I, I completely support it. Real estate is a very good place for criminals to, to clean money and it, it just it makes our industry bad and I don't want that. And that's why everyone has to be FinTracked. Not just people you think might be sketchy, okay? You can be like, oh, this guy's sketchy. I'm going to FinTrack him. you got to FinTrack your grandma. I, had, I just FinTracked my grandma, my wife's grandmother. I had to FinTrack her. Everybody, everybody gets FinTracked. And this is where you will have older clients that are like, you're not taking a picture. I don't have a photo ID. You don't have a passport, really? Like, come on. And most of the time, there's something they have that's not expired with the picture on it. If they literally have no ID that with a photo on it that isn't expired, you have to sit them with a lawyer and they have, you need a mandatory to like verify their ID. That's how important this is to real estate brokerages.
When you don't have FinTrack on your file, because you did the listing, you don't have to do it right away. Maybe they don't have all their stuff together and you don't get it done till the week after. The second I put a file in that doesn't have FinTrack, I get emails from my brokerage about it every day. Where's your FinTrack? Where's your FinTrack? So all this stuff has to be on file. All the signed documents for the listing and the offer, they all have to be on file. The stuff that can't just happen. Okay, and they get sent to your brokerage and then your brokerage distributes them to the lawyers. You can distribute them to the lawyers, but the FinTrack always just stays with your brokerage because that's private, right? The, it's the lawyer's job to also verify identity. So there's a bunch of links there for your information. Um, and I will ask some questions about FinTrack. It is required pretty much everywhere unless you're doing like leases, like residential leases. It's just it, it, everywhere else is pretty much a commercial, anything, sale, purchase of anything residential, you got to do FinTrack. Whether, even if they're not clients, even if they're not in the contract with you, if they're part of the agreement, you still have to FinTrack them. And it's not a verb. It's I'm, I just do it that way. Okay, so where do you get all this information? And again, I didn't have time within this podcast to provide you with a, a sampling of how I do this, but I, I will at the end of the video if you're interested, I'll show you how I go in. I'll put that at the end of this podcast, how I find stuff in Grand Bend. I'll show you Lampton as an example, because you can go and find all that stuff. That's the stuff I talked about earlier in this lecture. But generally speaking, like your, your big tools are web forms, the registry and DocuSign. So the only one we haven't seen, the only one we haven't had a general tour of is DocuSign. I've been in and out of web forms and I've shown you that the whole idea behind web forms is that you're not typing this all out, that you're not, sorry, writing this all out, that you're literally putting it in digitally and, and that you basically you never have to print or scan. And it's DocuSign that made that possible. So DocuSign is set up in a way that where you go in here, this is awesome. Like you, I don't know if this would help you or not, but. Not really. No, uh, you probably have your own systems. Yeah, Everything's right. digital though. It's all yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you have sales commission careers like this, there's always gonna be contracts that need to be signed. It's not just a routine thing and everyone's gonna be different. So you go in here, you click start. Okay, you upload a file. I'm gonna show you uploading one of the examples we had here, this listing package. Okay, you add your, um, sorry, you can add additional files as well. And they could be Word files and it'll still put them right in the PDF. You add the people that have to sign or initial. Okay, I'm just adding myself. You get into the document, you drag a signature, you drag an initial, or I'm initialing here, I'm, I'm signing, uh, you can change the zoom. Like it's, I learned how to use this in like an hour. Like it was just, drag it here. It's, you, you can't mess this up. I mean, and then you send it to the people, to their email address, they get an email, it says, hey, you got a DocuSign, you wanna review it. They click in it, they just go click, 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 it's done. And they're reading everything, of course. So um, that's been a huge time saver for me. And having said all of this, even with DocuSign, even with never having to print or scan anything hardly at all anymore, I'll still run into the occasional client who insists that it has to be uh, hard copy and, and that I got to scan it and they got to scan it back and I can't find a scanner. Um, it still consumes a lot of time. Uh, but this, this helps me, okay? Access and the way I've shown you in this in this podcast, I just want to make sure you understand my login through the matrix system, which does give me access to other real estate boards too. That may vary depending on where you work. Your access to the registry system may vary. The United States is a lot more open about all that stuff. You can see, I can look up, I can just Google what stuff sold for on Zillow in like two seconds and it's accurate, okay? Um, it's You just want to make sure you're using the proper tools to give you the proper information when you're putting stuff into listings and offers, not just listings. Now, after going through all of this stuff, you, you can only imagine that this is very heavily regulated. And this was part of our notes for this week. I don't need to get back into what all these things are. We've already defined them in previous lectures. They will pop back up again on the test. They just did an amendment to the Real Estate uh, Business and Brokers Act that was changing something about multiple representation. They're always advertising. These, these, this is like mass market news when stuff like this changes in Ontario. So that is basically the constitution of how RICO regulates us. And RICO is the Real Estate Council of Ontario. ARIA is the Ontario Real Estate Association that's, that helps educate and helps, they work with Humber to make sure a lot of the education 
is in line with everything that RICO has going on. And Korea is the Canadian Real Estate Association. We already know this. But the big one here, when you're actually doing deals, when you finally get out and start doing deals, is that the CRA is watching. They're watching you on HST. They're watching you on FinTrack. They're watching everything all the time. They're the, the government, guys. So just take this stuff seriously, okay? I know this was more of a crash course than anything. And that's what the questions on the test will be like. But I know the previous version of this course didn't even get into any of this stuff. Like this is what matters for you the most is whatever is going on where you're going to work. So I'm covering Ontario here and you need to make sure you understand the ins and outs of it. Okay. So when I say this is a big deal and you got to make sure your paperwork's right and oh, you might get sued. Oh, you might get this. Rico could come in and audit your brokerage at any time, at any time without notification. They give you like a couple days, I think. And if your files are a freaking mess, it's not necessarily going to be on your brokerage. Just it, like it's going to be on you just as much. And you may not be selling real estate the week after that. Okay, if you're not doing FinTrack and you're not doing everything correctly. They're watching, okay? So it's not just about your professor saying, hey, be on top of your details and do everything right and everybody will love you. It's so you can keep your freaking job, okay? It's important. If after all of this, you spend six months and you're just like, I can't take it. I'm done. This paperwork is brutal. And it is. And that's what our guest speaker on Wednesday is all about. He's going to come in here and present to you something that his brokerage has done that I don't feel like anybody else is really doing it as well as they are that streamlines their paperwork like so well. It's, it's just insane. So he's going to come and talk about that this week. Uh, you have to be all you have to be here Wednesday. If you're online, you got to watch that video and do your usual video report. So make sure of that. That's why I don't want to make this video too long, but I am going to add a bit of stuff at the end about how I do some research on zoning and stuff like that. So after all this is said and done, as I said at the very beginning of this, all that knowledge is not going to be all for naught. Okay. If you decide the paperwork's too much of a pain in the ass, but you got really good at it and you're really on top of stuff and you just don't want to keep doing it anymore, you could become a team leader or a broker. So basically you don't have to do all the new stuff anymore. You just take people's stuff in and tell them when there's mistakes and you get a chunk of all their deals if you're a broker or a team leader. Okay, you could be a buyer lead expert and be really good at nailing down buyers and getting buyer reps and stuff, but you're sick of the paperwork. You could start a lead generation firm. People that are really, really on top of the activity in markets often end up becoming appraisers instead of realtors. So. Uh, being the, the real estate salesperson can be very high stress and high demand and stuff like that. Um, appraisers, you know, you just, the, the work is there. As long as stuff is selling, the work is there. Mortgage brokers, we've talked to those guys. They're on the other end of things too. Um, you could get really into the house side of things and end up going the other direction with a lot less paperwork, becoming a home stager. But if you don't like paperwork, you're not going to like being a developer. Um, construction expert, you could be flipper, builder, contractor. You'd only have to fill out two or three of these agreements a year instead of 30 or 40, and you'd be making a lot of money flipping houses. But you, there's a little more risk involved there too um, because you, you can get surprises. You could even be end up being a media expert and starting a, a UAV firm, like a, like a drone firm or something like that. So. Once again, as I do every week, I'm always trying to tell you, yeah, this is a real estate course, but I know you guys all took this as, as an elective and there's like two people in here that might want to be realtors. It's still good knowledge to have, right? Because if you decide, oh, I want to be in sales commission in, uh, for a drug company, right? Good luck avoiding paperwork in that field. You're probably going to have twice as much, okay? So you be ready for this kind of stuff. It's out there. Okay, next class, guest speaker. Don't miss it. Please keep watching because I will add a little chunk to the end of the video here uh, showing you how I use some of the resources to get zoning and, and lot size and some of that stuff like that beyond the registry system. Hello, as a concluding component to this podcast, way back earlier in the lecture, we did discuss all these little details and how a lot of realtors don't make the best use of all the resources they have at their fingertips to make sure these details are correct. And sometimes they don't do much of anything where other times it's just enough for them to just look at the previous listing and leave it at that, where I, I never really think that's enough. I think you guys need to use all the resources you have to make sure that the buyers have all the information they can get to make the proper decision. So I'm just going to end the video as I promised by showing you um, a bit more of a tour of the resources we have access to. So I'm going to jump over to the web. 
and we are going to start in my board login. So I'm in the back end. So I don't log into realtor.ca. I log into my board's login and I input listings here if I've taken the broker load course, otherwise my brokerage does it for me. And then I can edit some of the things on those listings. I can, I can search listings, I can search listing history. So stuff that's sold, expired, canceled, whatever may have happened to it that, that does not have it on realtor.ca anymore, I can still see all that when I log into the board going back quite quite a while. So, and just recently, um, our particular board, so I'm part of the London St. Thomas Association of Realtors, and we, we have joined many other boards in the province in working together in this intra matrix backend login so that we can see listing history on other boards because it does happen often where an address in Grand Bend, for example, where I list a lot of properties, might have been listed on the Kitchener Waterloo board. Even though Grand Bend is not in their general geographic area, they can still list out of area if they want it on both boards. There are lots of realtors that believe that listing a property on the Toronto board, even if it's four hours away, can't hurt because it exposes your listing to all of these realtors in Toronto that might have more clients. I've tried it and never found that it does work. I think just good quality listings and marketing on realtor.ca works better than anything. But if you multi-list on boards, you the, the other realtors can find that history as well. But you, you just, your listing on realtor.ca, everybody can see it so no matter what. So if I only log into my board login, I only see the listings on my board. So I do still check realtor.ca once or twice a week if I have buyers looking aggressively in a market because private listings like... Um, like the Purple Bricks real, uh, brokerage I talked about and commission-free type listings, those don't often list on your local board. The, a lot of those are out of the Ottawa, Toronto boards. Um, so you have to check realtor.ca to see if they're there because they, they can list in your area but on another board. But now at least we can see these other boards. There's a couple that don't play nice with us. Um, we can't see history on the Sarnia board, which is really annoying for me because that's close to Grand Bend. Uh, the Toronto board has its own thing going on. There's maybe a couple other ones in the province, but most share together. So I'll show you an example here. If I go in, and again, I'm advising you not to just look at the listing history and base your new details for a listing on what the previous realtor had put in. I'm saying that's a bit dangerous, and I'll show you an example. And I'm not going to test you on how to search for it. There's lots of different ways. I'm just going to go in here quickly and find the property. Um, I search in Lampton Shores in Grand Bend. And I search for a property at an address, 37 Main Street. This is one that I was just thinking of. Um, now it says zero because right now I have these boxes checked. I'm only searching for active and conditional. So you would get comfortable with your own platform. I'm not going to teach you mine because they're going to change all the time and evolve. And you might work for a different real estate board altogether. And it might look totally different than this. So different boards have their own different policies, but it's, it might be similar. So I look in here and I see this property has been listed in the past. Okay, here's a listing here that was listed in April of 2017. And if I scroll down, it'll tell me when it expired. And I have the realtor's information. I'm, this is not a privacy thing like I had earlier in the video where I was showing owner information. And I'll explain that again in a second. It's, it's, but don't contact the realtor, obviously. This is just showing you examples. Okay, this, is, this was a public listing on realtor.ca. Now it's expired, but I can still see it in my board login. He does have the correct zoning, which is great. Um, a lot of realtors, as I mentioned, will just put COMM for commercial instead of actually looking up the zoning, which I will show you how to do here for this particular area. And every area will have a website where you can do that stuff. Uh, here's a, an interesting thing going on, though. Here's a listing for this address. Okay, it was listed a couple years ago, then it expired. It says it was built in 1982. If I go back and look at the older listing that was from the year before, same exact property, same exact photo, says it was built in 1966. Same exact realtor. So you need to be really careful um, with the details in these listings as a new listing agent. If you're getting a listing that was previously sold, find out as much as you can from the owner, from actual registry, from proper paperwork, instead of just trusting that the realtor has put the right information in. So for residential listings like mine, for example, okay, if I go and I keep using the same example so I don't have to... Uh, if you know the address, you should be able to just type it right in and it'll give you the full history. So here's here's before I bought the house. You can see the photos were pretty bad. And this, this was listed a while back. Um, I think it was actually listed by the previous realtor. Nope, no, nope, he had it right. He had it that way. Okay, and if I go down, there would be room measurements in here. These, 
These are not entirely accurate. It doesn't mean that realtor didn't measure them accurately. It's probably because I may have changed some of these rooms, right? So if I change the rooms, then I can't just go back to the previous listing and assume all that stuff is right. Um, this is not right. My house was built in 1976. So if like, I know this because I've looked this up in registry and I have files on my house. And so if you look at my listing, it has the proper year. It has different room measurements. It has more rooms now. Um, and, and the listings we have the ability to do now have much more information in them. Uh, so you can see my listings a lot more jam packed full of information, but it's just, it's looking at the same address listed by two different realtors and you're getting completely different information and not necessarily because the other realtor didn't have the right information because the house has actually changed. So you need to be aware of that too. Um, and I'll show you. So just a couple more minutes here on your board login, because this is where you will usually start. I'm encouraging you guys to go further and research your properties more with all the other resources you will have available. But if you feel that something was listed and you know you saw a sign on it and you can't find it on your board, like I know 37 Main Street was still listed this year. I, I could have sworn I saw it on realtor.ca. Okay, but when I look it up here, I don't see any listing in Grand Bend other than the ones that, that are like two years old. If I go into our intraconnected login, oops, let me go back here. It does that sometimes when you don't do it from the home page. Always quirks. So if I go into our interconnected login, I now am going to look up that address at a bunch of different boards. So when I type in 37 main here, just the address, you never put the street or avenue or boulevard, you just put the address, probably a lot of stuff is going to come up. Okay, yeah, and a fair amount did. But I do see at the top here, um, it doesn't show a municipality, which is funny because when I was looking for this earlier, I was, I was in cross property and I'm going to say it was a sale transaction. I'm going to uncheck this stuff because I just don't know. And I looked in Lambton and I couldn't find it. But when I went here and chose Grand Bend, which is still there in my history and put in 37 Main, okay, it did come up. So there's listing history of 37 Main here three times. And the last time it listed, it did actually sell. And you can see here, they don't even have to list the age. So certain boards have different requirements. And this realtor was able to skip over a few things. And I, I don't know if this was actually still listed when he sold it. So this might be what we call a sold posting, which is totally acceptable. You just, you, you're in an agreement with the seller that if it does sell, you're still allowed to post it. So it shows in your history and you can show it to your clients. Look how much stuff I've sold. I don't usually do that, but that's, I, I, I've spoken with this realtor before. He's a great guy. Um, he did eventually get this property sold. Took him a while, but it's done. It's not his fault. Commercial's tough. It's not his fault. Um, I don't want to <laughs> make it seem like I'm by any means slamming this guy. He's, he's been great. He was always really good to me when I wanted to show it. I thought there was a lot of potential there. I told everybody I showed it to. It's got to be worth over 550. They kept lowballing, lowballing, lowballing. And look what his seller got. So he proved them all wrong because at the end of the day, there is a lot of development and some stuff going on in Grand Bend right now. And they ended up getting over asking price because it's a double lot. It's a big piece of land and it's in the middle of a lot of activity right now in Grand Bend. And it just took a, a bit to get the right buyer. And when the right buyer came along, lo and behold, there was another buyer. I've seen it before. Stuff sits listed for three or four years and then, and then it goes to multiple offers with two different buyers, maybe even more. So they did great by turning down all the crappy offers I brought them with buyers, actually. Congratulations to these guys if they ever see this video for some reason, which they probably won't. But it, this is just an example to show you how much information you can get just from your board, but that you have to be careful because we saw those differences in years. And I'm not knocking this realtor for that either. I bet one side of this property, the one building was built in the 60s and the other side was built in the 80s. Although I, I've seen the other side that he says was 60s. I think it's more like 20s, but yeah, whatever. It, it's you, this is why we have errors and omissions. However, if you want the accurate information, okay, you would jump back to your regular board login homepage. And from there, you will have access to the registry system. So you have, and, and of course, the web form system, which we did cover earlier in the lecture. And this, this will be updated again since my video where we're going to the new web forms. Um, it's, it's constantly updated, but it's a, it's a platform that allows you to fill in the paperwork without having to print it out and type it out. This is just, yeah, everything's digitized now, but this is a very useful resource, which I've already clicked into over here and I've gone to my house again. So I don't keep reusing the same stuff. Once again, it's not, it, it's not private, uh, per se who owns a house and when they bought it and what they paid for it. It is a matter of public record, but as a licensed realtor, I am not to 
publicly just share that information without the permission of the owners. Um, if you ever wanted to get some of that and you weren't a licensed realtor, as I explained, you would simply go to your local registry office, pay a few bucks for the record, and it's yours. And this is why a lot of people, even with residential property, they put their properties into a trust or a private LLC or some type of corporation that doesn't trigger HST. Remember, we don't want that happening um, because they, they want that level of privacy. But as a general rule, who own the people that own public property is actually a uh, private property, sorry, the people that own private property is actually a matter of public record, which is an interesting rule. And it's the same way in the States. But in Canada's licensed realtors, we are not to just reveal that information. So I've, I've covered it up again here. So you don't see who my buyers were. That's really, you know, you can go pay for that if you want to see that. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, but I did open this up so you can see along the right side here, and I don't want to scroll through and show their names again, but just showing you a page in the registry system, you can buy these reports. So if you go into the report area, you can get the parcel register and the parcel register shows any things that are against the title. It shows when it changes ownership. It shows stuff like that. That's a little more of an expensive report. Um, if I scroll down a bit more, and again, you don't see the owner's names here. You can get some measurements that are somewhat accurate. I talked about that earlier in the video. There's that tax roll number that has to go in your listing. Um, the pin number, which is a little lower down and it'll be next to their name. So I'm not going to go there. That has to go in your listing, but this stuff is really useful. So I have this kind of stuff available. Okay. And that's not even the right address. 9621. Weird. Um, oh, because it's a double lot. It probably, yeah. So, and I've purchased this for my property and it's, I don't need to show it to you. It's a really simple document. It's just a PDF and it says you're built square footage, what kind of heat it has, all this kind of stuff. It's eight bucks. Okay. And you can get different types of reports. Um, so if you go here, view other assessment reports, there's all these different levels of reports and they show you what they include. Here, I'll show you the samples here. So you can view a sample. This is the simplest one. It just shows you kind of what type of house it is. It'll give you the actual zoning. If you can't seem to find it on the zoning map, um, that doesn't make, well, that's that's not the zoning. I, this is just an example of one in Markham Town, or whatever, whatever that is. You're built. So this gives you the proper year built. This gives you the assessment, which the taxes are based on, which is also something that's required to be put in our listings. The full legal description. So most of this you get through the registry file on it when you click on it to show the property report, but you don't get the year built. You don't get the basement total, the basement area finish, the heating type. And even this might not be 100% accurate because this is usually based on building permits and a lot of people do work without building permits. But at least this is almost every time I've pulled one of these, it's been correct. So um, if I go to a little bit of a step up, you can see they provide even more information, like what kind of services they have. And if I view the sample, so this is really useful stuff. You're going to get a listing that you're going to sell for $350,000, $400,000, and you're going to get a nice commission on that. It's worth spending the eight bucks. It, it's, it's not that much money. And you can see all the stuff that it shows in there. Okay, so a level two MPAC report is the kind of thing I typically like to purchase. I don't go with whether, I don't know if there is one higher. Um, there's level one and level two, and then there's a, a floor area report, which if they've put in good building permits, that should give you almost like a floor uh, plan. Um, AVM, yeah, there's all kinds of cool stuff you can get in here, but the one I usually use, um, oh, this shows how it's being assessed, if, whether it's going up and down according to what the taxes are, and it might even show sales around it. The one I usually use, is the level two, okay? And when we get into our assessment week, which is near the end of the semester, I'll also show how I use the registry system to create comparative market assessments. Because again, you don't wanna just use your login because there are lots of properties that change hands unlisted. And then there won't be a history here, but there's always a history in registry. Okay, and you also have to be careful in registry because some of the stuff transfers for like a dollar, just one family member to another. So we'll talk about that during the assessment week, but this is a place to get more information. Um, you can get a uh, number of bathrooms, you can get like all that stuff is usually in that level two report. If you look at that report, um, bedrooms, bathrooms, full baths, everything's in there. So it's not like you have to question now you should have visited the house. So that stuff you should know anyway, but it's just nice that it gives you the year built and the actual square footage. And then you can ask them, is this pretty close to what you think you have? Or have you done an addition here without a building permit? And then you can add the square footage. Um, 
You also need to be careful about becoming aware of somebody doing something without a permit and then not disclosing that to clients. Again, it's not a requirement because you don't have to go and find out if they should have had one or not. Um, that is the seller's job, but if someone were to ask, you would then have to tell them. So it's just something to be aware of. So uh, that's a great resource. From there, you can just start Googling the area you're in, the local municipality, the local city, and you would not believe what you could find. So since I've been working heavily in Lampton Shores, I've found their zoning page. So I go to their zoning page and look at how easy it is to dig up information here. So I go to their zoning page and I just Googled Lampton Shores zoning and then it'll show me their zoning bylaw. So they have a comprehensive zoning bylaw. So if I click on this and I download it, okay, right here, the zoning bylaw, and I don't need to go through that with you. It's just a big, huge PDF with all sorts of stuff in it, okay? And if I wanna find something specific, I use Control F. So I use a text search string to find something specific. And what I would be looking for is the zoning. So here's all the here are all the areas in Lampton Shores. And if I go to Grand Bend, I'll show you that property I was just looking at at 37 Main Street. Okay, if I zoom on this, see this R1? Okay, R6-2, R6, R4, R3. These are all different residential zonings that have different descriptions and different definitions for what they actually are, okay? And I have each of these usually saved separately from, I, I should grab the zoning dialog and just show you what I do. Um, so I'll grab that too, okay? I have each of these saved separately on my computer so I can email them to my clients. Very few realtors do that. Like my clients really appreciate them when they, especially when they're looking at commercial, they say, okay, C10 zoning. What are my setbacks, right? When they ask me that question, I already know what that means. I didn't know what that meant until I went through some of my real estate classes, but now I do. And I, I'm much more familiar with it now. C10 zoning is a commercial zoning downtown that's like row commercial, like a bunch of buildings in a row, like on Richmond Row, like we have in London, where there are zero setbacks, meaning you don't have to build away from the lot line. You can literally build with zero lot lines, 100% coverage. That's very rare in small towns, but you usually see it just on the main street. So C6 is a little different, even though it's right around the corner from C10. And right now I'm in the middle of a bit of a struggle with this client who bought that property because he wants to be a little closer to the lot lines, but his commercial zoning actually has heavier setbacks than... Uh, residential even where c10 you can build right to the side and this is c10 right here but c6 because he sandwiched right in between residential it's just the way it, it happened right so if i wanted to know for sure how that was set up i'd go into the zoning bylaw and then i go control f i'm not going to read 180 pages or whatever this is i want to find the general definitions of c6 so i just keep going to the next one there's 43 matches and eventually we get to the definition of it. So this is really cool. So it shows me, here are the things you can do. Here is your minimum lot area. So the lot has to be at least this big. If for some reason it has the zoning, but the lot is not that big, that's called legal non-conforming. It somehow got the zoning before they made it required to be that big. This one is that big. Um, it has all these things, but you have to be four and a half meters. That's like 15 feet away from the lot line, right? Where your standard residential side setback is only 1.2 meters. Um, but it's right next to a house. So what they're pro probably trying to do is not get the commercial activity so close to the house. So the owners of that house next door are like, no, you know what? They asked for what's called a variance and they don't want to let them do that. I'm not going to test you on all this stuff. Don't worry. I'll just ask you, you know, some general questions about how you might find additional information. Um, and they're struggling with that because they'll probably continue to operate on a commercial level. So why should they get to be closer to the houses next door, right? It kind of it kind of makes sense. I, I, I could see the arguments both ways, but I understand why the neighbors were were resistant to it. And I think what these guys are going to do now is just stay within the setbacks and do their commercial thing. So these are their setbacks, which means if they do anything new now, even though the existing building is really close to the side because it was there before it got this zoning. So that's legal non-conforming. Um, I might actually ask you a question about that just to quiz people for getting into the end of the video. The legal non-conforming thing is fairly important that even though... A zoning bylaw um, says certain certain things have to be a certain way. If something was already that way before the zoning bylaw was stuck on that property, it is legal. If somebody did something after without permission, contrary to the zoning bylaw, they can ask they can, they can be asked to have it undone. So you got to be careful. You got to get building permits. You got to ask permission. You got to talk to the planner. It's a whole process, right? And that's not our job as realtors to do that. 
But it is our job to understand these things. So when I tell you guys that you have to wear many hats as a realtor, I, and I've been saying this since day one, this is, I, I am not kidding around. Um, so I've gotten very good with this zoning stuff. And so I would, the second somebody would make an inquiry on this property, I'd, I have extracted, like I download the PDF, I extract these three or four pages from it and I'll send them that. And then I'll send them the link to the zoning bylaw. So if they want to understand what a tourist establishment is, right? You can search the zoning bylaw for tourist establishment. And that's the thing. It's not going to, and, and then there. So this defines what it is. Okay. And then you understand exactly what you are allowed to do at that property. There's no question about it. You know, going in, if people have questions about that, you don't just say, oh yeah, it's something like this. You give it to them in writing. You give them what the municipality. So every city, every municipality across the pro province will have, across the country, will have links to files like this and easy access. This is 2020, people. Like, You're not going to have trouble finding this stuff. So don't think as a realtor, you don't have to spend an extra 20 minutes on this. You need to. Okay, You need to show your clients that you're stepping it up, that you're your attention to detail is a little bit better than the next guy. So there's zoning is huge. You want to always look at that. You, you want to have those printed and ready to go. Every municipality I've gone to also has a zoning map. So does London. Theirs is really good. You can go to the city of London webpage and you can find the zoning map, find your street. You'll know exactly what your zoning is. I want to know if I could turn my house into a duplex or if I'm going to have to sort of hide the fact that I'm actually doing that. Go to the London city zoning map, find your zoning, go to the bylaw, open it up, you Google everything, it's all there. You don't have to be a realtor to do this, okay? This is all free access. The registry system, that's realtor access. I have a subscription for that. You have to go to the courthouse. This other stuff, you just find it online. Let's say your owner is out of the country. They already signed their documents. You don't know what the taxes are. Your best guess is to estimate them. Here on county, I look up here on county taxes. I go here to one of their PDFs. They've got their tax rates all listed right here. Lampton Shore is even better. You can put in the assessment from registry and it'll estimate the taxes for you. They're probably going to be pretty darn close. So you can still get this information without having it handed to you. And this, the end of this video here, this conclusion was just to show you how easily you can access all this stuff. You can even, sometimes people have put listings up on other sites that aren't really, you know, they're competing with realtor.ca. As I mentioned, we don't have like Zillow and Trilio and Trilia or all these extra sites like they do in the States that are competing with the MLS. Realtor.ca is just the dominant force here in Canada. Um, but there are, there might still be evidence of these properties being listed on Kijiji and other places online. You can find some of that if you Google around. So there's, there's always more information if you can't get enough from your owners. And I encourage you all in any profession, not even real estate, to always find out as much as you possibly can about a situation before you start flapping your lips and telling people stuff. You got to make sure you're educated. It's very, very important. So that's why this week had one of the longest podcasts ever, because the week covering real estate is the week that if you don't pay attention to it and you do become a realtor and you just ignore everything you're taught about pa paperwork, you probably be, did I say real estate, the week covering real estate paperwork you probably end up losing your job pretty fast. So you want to get as much information as you can. You want to be accurate. You always want to be on top of stuff. Um, big, huge theme of this podcast, okay? And there will probably be more questions on this week's podcast with the guest speaker and everything than any other week we've had since week seven that are going to contribute. The test is going to be 50 multiple choice questions. It's not that big of a deal, but this is an easy week for me to generate a lot of questions. And I feel it's one of the most important weeks we've covered uh, because you can get in a lot of trouble if you don't stick with the paperwork. And as you can see throughout this week, we keep stuff, attention to detail and the way you are as a person and all this, all these kind of things keep coming up uh, later in the course because of the type of profession it is. Uh, so that's it for the extension on the video, which ended up being another 25 minutes. Holy cow, it's going to be a long one this week. Uh, if you actually watched it to the end, I cannot thank you enough. Again, don't forget, and I'll tell you this at the end, you can always speed up my voice if you want these things to be a little more quick. Uh, so, see you next week.